Proudly we hail. City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the United States Air Force. Titled Experiments in Space. This is the story of a project carried out in a new field of science, the field of space medicine created by the United States Air Force Medical Service. This project took Air Force men and machines on a dangerous and spectacular voyage into the upper atmosphere to the last frontier of flight. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first, young man, if you're a high school graduate, unmarried and otherwise qualified, there's a future for you as an aviation cadet in the United States Air Force. You'll receive a year of the world's finest flying training and graduate as a second lieutenant earning more than $5,000 a year. Here's the opportunity of a lifetime to serve your country and build a career that will fit you for responsible positions in both military and commercial aviation. Visit your Army and Air Force recruiting station for details. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Experiment in Space. The plane you hear is a B-47 Stratojet. It's headed for the Aero Med Lab at Wright Air Development Center, Dayton, Ohio. The two pilots at the controls, Major Clint Graves, 33, World War II eighth, in the front seat, and First Lieutenant Bud Titus, 24, a young jet flyer in the rear seat, are mystified by their new assignment to the Air Force Aero Medical Laboratory. They know very little about aviation medicine or the work being carried on at Wright Air Force Base. As they cruise comfortably along, they're quiet, full of vague misgivings and uncertainty. Finally, Bud gives voice to his thoughts. You know, Clint, when I graduated into jets last year, I thought I was all through with school. What goes on at this laboratory, do you know? Oh, they fool around with medicine, bioclimatology, physiology, things like that. They do? Then what do they need me for? Well, maybe they want you for a new experiment. To find out which has the most brains, dodo birds or jet jockeys. Ah, oh, seriously, Clint, I don't like it. Our old outfit was the best in the Air Force. I'm going to figure an angle to get back to it. Lay off the angles. Too many of them keep a guy from flying straight and level. Yeah, well, don't worry about me. Any place I want to get, boy, I get. Yeah, well, in that case, start calling the tower. There's Wright up ahead. Roger. Wright Tower, this is Air Force Jet 9417. Request landing instructions. Hey, pretty good landing for an old veteran. You really greased her in. Oh, well, thank you, pal. Uh, after you open the door, hand me my crutches and I'll crawl off to the old man's home. Yeah. 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 So this is the Arrow Med Lab, huh? Where are all those beautiful nurses I hope to see? Clint! Mm. Clint Gray! Hey, a Clint. calling you, Clint. Uh, oh, it's the colonel. Doc, well, I'll be... Doc, right! <laughs> well, it's good to see you, Clint. It's been a long time, hasn't it? Not since V.E. Day in Brussels, I guess. That's right. Oh, some <laughs> celebration that was. Yeah. Uh, Bud, meet my old flight surgeon, Monty Wright. Oh, glad to know you, Colonel. All right. Hey, Doc, you are a colonel at that. Night's gone. Quite a coincidence running into you here. Well, it's not exactly a coincidence, Clint. I sent for you. You what? You... You sent for us, Colonel? But why, Doc? What do you need guys like us for? We're not medics or scientists. Well, sometimes we need flyers here as much as we need doctors or scientists. 
Well, why are we here? Well, I'd rather you knew a little more first about the kind of work we do at the lab. Then perhaps your project won't come as so much of a shock. Well, that sounds ominous. We're with you, Doc. Let's see the work. And in here is the heaviest piece of equipment in our lab, the human centrifuge. The what? The centrifuge. It's a device for measuring the number of G-forces a man can stand. As a jet pilot, you know all about G-forces, don't you, Tyler? Roger, it's the weight of a pilot's body. Yes, a G is the unit of measurement we use to describe body weight under normal conditions. Now, the centrifuge here allows us to study the effects of great accelerations on the human body to simulate certain conditions in a high-speed airplane. Uh Depending on the revolutions per minute of this centrifuge, we can vary the G-forces acting on the subject. Well, it's interesting, Doc. Uh, How's it work? Well, the principle is really quite simple. That gondola over there is whirled around like a bucket on the end of a string. Just as a stone would be pinned on the bottom of the bucket... So a man in the centrifuge is pinned against the back of his seat. Well, brother, that thing's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've climbed into many jet sighters where you undergo the same forces. That's what we use it for, to find out how much a man can take and still be safe. Our physiologists have found that men spun in the centrifuge can take up to 10 Gs and still move their arms and legs. Several of our experimenters have endured up to 17 Gs in the centrifuge without blackout or redout. Brother, and I thought I'd been on some rough mission. Well, it isn't as bad as you think. Uh, stand back, and I'll show you the centrifuge in action. No, 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 no. Don't ride in that thing on our account, Colonel. We believe you. No, no, this time it'll be a dry run. <laughs> you all clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Here she goes. It's at seven G's now. At seven G's, the blood is as heavy as liquid iron. Fourteen G's now. Your blood would be as heavy as mercury. Man, take that crazy merry-go-round, huh? The gondola gets up to a speed of 173 miles per hour. We've discovered that when a man is lying in the prone position... The G-forces act from back to chest and can more easily be tolerated. That's how you boys will pilot rockets someday. Rockets? I'm just an old-fashioned jet pilot. You better start looking ahead, Titus. There's no doubt that aviation will eventually grow into space flight. At the lab here, we're just preparing for the inevitable. Doc, I had no idea aviation medicine included such spectacular stuff. Why, it's almost like science fiction. It's by no means science fiction, Clint. And it's by no means all so spectacular. Now, take the valuable work Lieutenant Meadows is doing down the hall. That's the side of it you should see, too. Right down the hall here. Uh Hey, hey, what goes on here? It looks like something between a a, a model kitchen and a chem lab. That's exactly what it is. Meadows is working on in-flight feeding problems where air crews are sometimes kept aloft for long stretches of time. Oh, brother, look at that steak over there. Yeah. If that's an example, they've come a long way from the K-rations we used to get on mission. Oh, yes. Meadows has helped to develop an entire line of in-flight foods that will do credit to any fine restaurant. Ah, Lieutenant Meadows. I was just describing your work to these gentlemen. I hope you don't mind. Indeed not, Colonel. Go right ahead. Oh, brother, talk about being spectacular. You're the most spectacular thing I've seen so far, Lieutenant. Why, thank you. But I'm just a plain garden variety specialist in the Air Force Medical Service. Well, I'm trying to interest my two friends in our work. Uh, Lieutenant Claire Meadows, Major Clint Graves, and Lieutenant Bud Titus. Yeah, how do you Hello. do? Hello, They've been assigned to us temporarily. Uh, it, it, it would be nice working with you permanently, Lieutenant. I'm, uh, I'm uh, very good at eating steak, if that interests you. Not in the least. You seem to me more like the type for Pavian. Oh. Uh, you mustn't mind, Bud Lieutenant. These uh, supersonic boys try to talk as fast as they fly. Well, anyhow, we've interrupted Lieutenant Meadows long enough. Let's get on to my office, where I'll tell you about the T-1 suit. Yeah. Will you say that again, please, Colonel? The T-1 suit. The most important project at the base right now. And the reason you men are here. As soon as I 
I get this safe open, you'll have a look at it. So far, we've kept the T-1 pretty much under wraps. Uh-uh, here she comes. Now, this, gentlemen, is the T-1 suit. What do you know? Holy cow, Doc, that does look like something a man from Mars would wear. And unless we've been on the wrong track, Clint, very shortly, it'll be standard Air Force equipment. Uh-huh. For, for what? Masquerade? No, 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 nothing quite so bizarre. It's to be used for flying in the upper atmosphere. Up there, crews meet many of the same environmental hazards that exist in space. The T-1 is a pressure suit. You mean to be used in case of emergency, Doc? That's right, Clint. Today, engineers can build planes to penetrate the upper atmosphere. The only trouble is this fragile human frame of ours isn't adequate to man them. It's the job of aviation on medicine to keep human factors in pace with the amazing progress of aircraft designers and engineers. That's why we're developing the T-1 suit. Colonel, I, I'm sorry, but I, as I said before, I'm just an old-fashioned jet pilot. I'm not even keeping pace with you. Well, let me put it this way, bud. You know that without protection, man will suffocate for lack of oxygen at high altitude. Yes, sir. Around 50,000 feet, the entire process of respiration comes to an end. Yes, sir, but what about pressurized cabins? They take care of all that, don't they? Well, they do. But what happens if the cabin becomes depressurized through an accident or enemy action? Well, ex explosive decompression. Right. That's why we've developed this T-1 suit. It's a vital piece of emergency equipment. If cabin pressures drop, the suit is built to inflate automatically. It forms a protective envelope of its own for the man inside it. Has anyone tried it yet, Doc? No. We're only approaching that final stage now. Tests with personnel. That's the job I want you to do for us. Well, why us? Because Clint here has the kind of all-around flying experience we need. Moreover, he majored in biophysics at college. Well, that sounds like interesting work, Doc. Wait a minute, wait a minute. All I ever thought about, Colonel, uh, in college was flying jets. Where do I fit in? As Clint's co-pilot, I assume the two of you would make a good team. That and your difference in age, among other factors which we've checked, made the two of you seem to be excellent for the kind of experimental work that must be done. Well, frankly, sir, I'm not so sure I go for this deal. Well, well I guess orders are orders. Oh, no, 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 Bud. That's not the way I want it. Now that I've had the chance to explain the job to you in person, I want things on a voluntary basis. Some of the work might be dangerous. It deals largely with the unknown. The final decision is yours. You are listening to the Proud to be Hailed production, Experiment in Space. We'll return in just a moment for the second act. Daring and imagination, courage and science. These have propelled us straight into the jet age, the age of air speed faster than sound, of flight into the farthest frontiers of the sky. Young man, how would you like to master one of those jet planes, sleek, powerful aircraft which represent the last word in military aviation? They're considered safer to fly than the old propeller planes. If you qualify for and successfully complete the interesting, exacting training of an aviation cadet, you'll have the chance. As a pilot in the United States Air Force, practicing a challenging career in the service of your country, you'll start as a second lieutenant, earning more than $5,000 a year. If you're between 19 and 26 and a half, in good health, single, and meet mental and educational requirements, you're eligible to apply for the 16-month flight training course. See if you can qualify at your nearest Air Force base or local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now we present the second act of Experiment in Space. <laughs> hey, hey, Clint, come on over. You know, it's not a bad mm -hmm. officer club they got here at Wright. Pull up a chair and enjoy it. Bud, you've been sitting on the back of your neck around here for two days. Mm -hmm. It's about time you told Doc whether you volunteer for the T-1 project or not. All right, all right. Don't rush me. I, uh, I spent the afternoon being briefed on the first test they're going to run on the suit in the altitude chamber. Oh? You should have been there. Well, I never did like those overgrown pressure cookers, Clint. Nope, the T-1 ain't for this fly, boy. Oh, you were right when you called yourself just an old-fashioned jet pilot. 
These new ideas scare the deuce out of you, don't they, boys? Oh, look, Clint, you're not going to get a rise out of me that way. I don't scare <laughs> easy, but this this screwy suit just isn't my meat. Period. We're looking for you, Clint. Hey, can I oh. see you a minute? Yeah, sure thing, Doc. Excuse us, bud. Yeah. I've asked Lieutenant Meadows to keep you company while I go over a few things with Clint. We won't be long. Oh, take your time, Colonel. Well, 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 well. Sit down, Lieutenant. It's a pleasure. Thank you. There you are. Well, you been dropping any more fresh jet jockeys in the deep freeze over at your lab? <laughs> I guess I did seem cold when we met, but uh, you have to admit you were pretty brash. Well, if brash means being knocked into a flat spin, you're quite right, Lieutenant. There you go again, Lieutenant. <laughs> Aren't you afraid that line of yours will flame out someday? Hey, hey, you're some gal. You dig jet jive, Well, huh? just enough to find my way around the flight line. <laughs> You forget, I'm in the Air Force, too. Oh, no, no, not for a minute. It gives us so much in common. Uh, seriously, Lieutenant, I want to apologize for the stuffy way I treated you. I didn't realize you were one of Colonel Rice's volunteers. Oh, I admire the job you're doing. Oh, wait a minute, I'm not... Well, uh, I mean, you see, it's like this, what I, what I mean well, is... Now, I... Lieutenant, this modesty is unbecoming. Stay as brash as you are. Okay, Lieutenant, if you like me brash, that's what I'll be. How's about dinner tonight for a start? Oh, sorry, I, uh, I have some important lab work this evening. Well, what about tomorrow night? More lab work. Well, when? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this a stall? Friday. And I, I'm really sorry, I can't make it sooner. All right, all right, Friday it is. And now, believe it or not, I have to get back to the lab. Now, wait a minute, <laughs> Lieutenant. The Colonel ordered you to stay with me, keep me company. I heard him. Uh-uh. Like you, I volunteered for the job. <laughs> so long. So long. Hey. Hey, bud. What happened? You losing your fatal grip? Where'd Claire go? Hmm? Well, I know Claire. She went back to her lab. Oh. Yes, yes, that's uh, that's right, Colonel. You know, people are sure busy around here. Now, Clint's told me you've decided the T1 isn't for you. Sorry you won't be here for our altitude chamber test on Friday. On Friday, huh? Well, who says I won't be here Friday? Huh? Colonel, I volunteer. What? Well, but... But what made you change your mind? Well, I'll tell you, Clint, I've got some important lab work of my own. Hey, uh, Benson, you understand clearly how we want the altitude chamber operated on this experiment? Oh, yes, sir. Evacuate pressure up to 50,000 feet according to the Brookings graph. I have a control memo right in front of me. Fine. Now, remember, boys, stay on intercom all the time. The automatic computers will figure most of the information for us. But let me stress one thing. Report immediately if you have even the slightest suspicion of some malfunction. Malfunction? I got a heavy date tonight. Well, it'd be doing her a favor if you got deflated. Now, go on, get oh, in. Oh, what's the rush? We got reserved seats, haven't we? Any last-minute questions, Clint? Bud? No, sir. Oh, take her away, Doc. Good luck. Seal her up. Take it, Benson. Right, sir. Simulated altitude, 23,000 feet, sir. Hold them there a minute, Benson. How's it going, boys? A lead pipe cinch. Fine. Be especially alert from now on. You'll be working in red line density. Stage two, Benson. Simulated altitude, 40,000 feet, sir. Hold it a minute, Benson. Clint, you're at Angel's 40. Roger, Doc. The suit's a dream. Take us on up. How about you, bud? No complaints, sir. Stage three, Ben. Fifty thousand feet, sir. Hold that level a moment, Benson. You're at fifty thousand feet. We'd never know it. 
All the instruments check out perfectly on the board out here. Then why stop at 50,000, Doc? Well, 50,000 feet is what we call the functional border of space. That's as far as respiration is concerned. We'll hold you there a couple of more minutes and then start repressurizing. Roger, Doc. Hey, wait till I tell Claire. This job is real cool, really gone. The well, next time maybe Doc will let you bring her along. Uh, How about that, Doc? Uh, what? Bud, you okay? Bud? Doc, something's gone wrong with Bud's suit. I know. Looks like some air pads blew. Well, get him out of here. He's passed out. I can't. Have to depressurize slowly or your suit's liable to blow up, too. Never mind me. He needs help. How bad is he? I can't tell. Doc, you're going to get him out of here now? Well, what about you? It's too much of a chance. My suit's okay, I know. Please, Doc, get the bud. Will do. Benson, depressurize SOP complete. But, Colonel, what about Clint? Graves thinks his suit can take it. The other man's time reserve is running out. Pull out the stops, Benson. Stage one. Yes, sir. <laughs> Six thousand feet, sir. Five. Four. Good enough. Open her up. All right, easy. Easy with him. How's he look, Doc? Well, not too bad. The tubes that didn't blow out saved him. What? What happened? And I'll take it easy, bud. You'll be okay in a few minutes. Three of the tubes blew out in his suit. Oh. Thank the Lord the other 12 held. Yeah. I felt like a mule kicked me in the stomach. Hey, look. Here's how it happened. A valve clock. It was close, huh? I'm sorry I couldn't do better for you, Doc. You found out something we had to know. Does that mean we have to start all over again, Doc? I should say not. No, we learned what we wanted to from the chamber. The next step is to redesign the valves according to what we learned today. Then we'll test the suit in flight. During the next few weeks, Clint and Bud put in long hours working with Colonel Rice on the suit. And Bud is doubly busy because he's also courting Claire Meadows. The two pilots run more than a dozen tests on the suit, most of them in flight. Between flights, Colonel Rice and his staff modify the suit, make infinitely small adjustments and readjustments, which are suggested by the reports of the two pilots and the mass of statistical information the instruments record. Finally, the colonel is ready to order a full production model on the T-1 suit. But first, there's one thing they must know. Can a man bail out in it at the functional border of space where no one has ever tried it before and survive? That's the big question. Then, one gray dawn... Clint Graves, Bud Titus, Colonel Rice, and a third pilot, Jake Evans, sit quietly in the ready room, taking pure oxygen, preparing for the big hop. That's enough oxygen, boys. Let me check over your suit once more, Bud. Yes, sir. I've been in this suit so much recently, Colonel, I ought to wear it for pajamas. Well, just stay wide awake this morning, Bud. That's all I ask. <laughs> Level off. One thing about it, there's no turbulence up here. Well, this is where I get off. Right, Colonel? Run over the checklist with Jake once again, bud. Roger. Flotation gear. Check. Battery and radio. Check. Bailout bottle. Check. CI regulator. Check. Drogue chute. Check. Main chute. Check. That covers it. Any sign of decompression sickness, bud? Not a whiff in this suit. You should have been a seamstress. Okay, then. We're ready to complete the test. Prepare for bailout. And take good care of that oxygen bottle. Roger, Doc. Stand by to open Bombay, Clint. Roger, Doc. Good luck, Squirt. Open Bombay, Jake. Bombay open. SOP complete. It's all yours, bud. Proceed with bailout. Bud leaps into space. Through the perpetual dark blue above 40,000 feet where the stars always shine, he plummets downward. 
Only the T-1 suit stands between his Earth-conditioned frame and sudden death in the outer regions of the atmosphere. Is it good enough? Falling. Falling. A free fall of 30,000 feet, the longest man has ever tried. And then the automatic chute tears open. And all tangled up in the shroud lines. The pigs are squealing and grunting. And I'm making just as much noise out of pure happiness. But man, you should have seen the, that farmer's face. He got one look at the old T1 suit and lit out of the place like he had a rocket booster in his hip pocket. Oh, God, really? But I'm, but I'm still furious that you kept the bail out such a secret from me. Why, honey? Well, when a girl's fiancé makes history, she should be told about it. That makes us even, Claire. He didn't breathe a word to me about this engagement party. Well, tonight. like I always said, Doc. Bud's just a shy, old-fashioned jet pilot. Well, anyway, congratulations, Bud. Every happiness to you, Bud. Oh, thank you, Colonel. I guess you know by now how grateful I am you had me sent here. For one thing, I never would have met Claire. Well, I'm grateful to you. You and Clint deserve as much credit as anyone for the success of the T-1 suit. I just sent a telegram to Washington recommending production on the T-1. Well, if they make a formal model, I'll wear it to Bud's wedding. (laughs) That's very apropos. Well, I hate to break up the party, but I must call it a night. Oh, Doc, don't go. It's still early. Well, not for me. Don't forget, we in space medicine have a big job getting you pilots set for things to come. I have to be at work first thing tomorrow morning on a new project. The biggest yet. Young man, do you have a flair for scientific subjects, physics, mathematics, electricity, astronomy? As an aircraft observer in the United States Air Force, you would use your technical knowledge as a rated flying officer on an Air Force flying team in an interceptor, bomber, reconnaissance, or transport plane. You'd be trained to operate the latest in electronic and radar equipment. You'd be a member of a flying team trained in such skills as navigation, bombardment, radar interception, and others. You're eligible to apply if you're between 19 and 26 and a half single, and have a high school diploma. If you pass written and physical entrance examinations, you'll start on a 14-month intensive training course. Then, graduation, aircraft observer wings, a commission as an Air Force lieutenant, earnings over $5,000, and an interesting assignment as flying officer in your United States Air Force. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center for the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in the same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>